think of it as an industrial processor. You've got your vats, you've got your process, your engines, and your chir- you're basically whirling and shutting things into smaller parts. Hey guys, welcome back to the Science Centric Podcast. Before we dive in, a couple of quick reminders. One is to like this video, and the other one is to subscribe to the channel. If you wanna support us directly, you can do so on Patreon. We have a bunch of nice benefits over there, including early access to new episodes, ad-free episodes, um, a monthly live Q&A with me where you can suggest new ideas for shows or guests and uh, we'll add your name to the end of full podcast episodes. And those benefits start at $1 a month. So check out the show notes or head over to sciencecentric.com slash support. So our guest for this episode is Dr. Vincent Ho. Uh, He is an academic gastroenterologist who works as a researcher and senior lecturer at Western Sydney University in Sydney, Australia. He is also a practicing doctor who sees patients with all kinds of gut problems. Um, In his spare time, he's created a website and a YouTube channel called The Gut Doctor and is the author of the upcoming book, The Healthy Baby Gut Guide, due out in June of 2020. 22. So hopefully I got all of that right. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Eric, for inviting me. <laughs> cool. Um, so I, I have a, I've, I've read your book. Uh, um, I have a ton of questions for you. Um, so it's a little bit tricky where, where to start. Um, we can definitely talk about, you know, the book. Um, but I, I think what might be interesting to, for people to understand, uh, first of all, is just what is your gut? Um, I mean, we, we all know that phrase from like, oh, I have a gut feeling or whatever, but what constitutes the gut? What, what makes you the gut doctor? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great question, Eric. And really, the gut is an organ that I am so interested in. Um, the best way to, to describe the gut really is it is an organ but it's more than just an organ because it's an organ that connects to every single other uh, organ in the body. So while it's internal and it's hidden, and that's why it's kind of mysterious because you can't really see it, um, it, it, it's, it starts really from the mouth itself and it ends all the way at the very end at, at, out, out with, the, with the anus. And so anything along that tract, um, which is involved in handling food, digestion, absorption, um, breaking down, importantly, food into its smaller parts. All of that is part of the gut. So the gut is really what I would term to be uh, an organ. It's quite complex. There's a lot of action that, that's going on. And we're learning more about it all the time, Eric. It's actually so amazing. Um, and is a way to think of it as like kind of a big fermentation chamber? Uh, is that is that a good way of thinking about the gut? That's absolutely right. So in the past, people okay. used to realize that, that it was just, yes, we've got this tube and there's a lot of processing and mixing. But as you say, there's, it's teeming and teeming with bacteria. So fermentation tank, for sure. Lots of stuff is being processed and bacteria is producing a lot of ingredients too. There's gas and a lot of other good stuff too that it's, it's actually, that's creating, yeah. it's creating. So as we're as we eat something, where it's it's going down through all these chambers and tubes and, and uh, being digested and fermented, and and then we're extracting out all those nutrients and, and things like that. That's right. That's, that's kind of the main function. That's yeah. exactly right. I mean, think of it as an industrial processor. You've got your vats, you've got your process, and your engines, and your chir- you're basically whirling and churning things into smaller parts. And as you say, you know, there's story there's there's vats for storage. There's uh, enzymes which have been added in, so chemicals which have been added in to break down foods. All of that is occurring. And at the end of it all, yeah. you get some waste, which is eliminated from the processor as such. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I, 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 think, I think what you were, what you were talking about before is this, this idea, and we've had other guests on the show um, talking about, uh, you know, the microbiome and things like that. But there was this idea that it was just sort of this, all these chemical processes going on, but there's also all these biological processes going on, right? Like, 
with with yeast and bacteria and all these other microbes and things that that that's kind of a would you say that's a new idea or it's just one that's become popular it's look it's been around for a while um we've realized that there's been gut uh bacteria um present for quite some time at least o- over 100 years but i think what we've realized now is that it's an amazingly complex ecosystem so you've got your microbiota as such is just is your bacteria i think is a dominant um living species but you've got other things too as you've pointed out fungi got present you've got um a group of similar to bacteria called archaea which are present and you've got other things which can exist sometimes like parasites that that, that play a role viruses themselves so the gut has got viruses too which 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 is part of that microbiota so it's actually a very rich ecosystem and i think what's exciting about this is that and and this is something that we're realizing the last couple of decades that the microbiota is very much tied in to our health our systemic health and the development of different diseases yeah um and we've only kind of realized that diversity in that in our terms of the microbiota so what's the i guess the question for you is like what's the difference between the microbiome and the microbiota yeah so i would like to say that the microbiota is really the collection of all your organisms whereas the microbiome is very similar but it's also referring to genetic material or genetic information because um the old days we used to be able to detect the presence of bacteria predominantly through culturing based techniques so that's why the term microbiota was was used a lot but now that we're using more techniques to look for genetic information we're using the term microbiome so they're very similar microbiome and microbiota and mm-hmm. i would view the microbiome as really all of the, the 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 microbes but also the genetic information as well so you need the gen- mm. that, that that information is is critical um and it's a critical part of the definition of microbiome and and it's, I think this is true of a lot of different fields, whether you're talking about oceanography or you're talking about human health or whatever, like we have so much more information about the diversity of uh, microbes because we have genetic sequencing and things like that before we just maybe had less precise tests, right, in terms of what we could identify. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, so that's a good maybe segue into into talking about um, you know human health and in particular health for infants. Um, although obviously we all started off as infants, so it's all it's it's completely relevant to to adult health as well. But how does all that how do how do all those microbes get in there? What what um you know how do we because I, I what I gathered from the book is that we're not really born with any of that stuff in our in our gut uh that, those important microbes yeah so this again is such an interesting point because for a long time eric um there was a debate about whether the infant gut itself certainly growing in the womb was it sterile or not you know was it full of was it full of microbes or was it actually sterile and what we've come to realize is, is that it actually is sterile and the reason for that is that it, it's it's unusual to get microbes uh, in utero in the infant gut. It generally only happens if the the infant is very sick, and and often if there is um, if there is sepsis going on and and what we call enterocolitis, those sorts of conditions, you can get these microbes um, which are, which are present. But it, as a general rule, microbes are not found in utero in the infant gut. So they are acquired mm-hmm. in life. And we know that when it comes to mode of, of delivery, that's actually really important, Eric, because we know that if, if babies are born via uh, vaginal delivery, that the, they tend to acquire microbes from the vagina. Whereas from a cesarean section, they tend to pick up, not surprisingly, skin microbes. And so it's those microbes that tend to populate the infant gut and the, the uh-huh. because it's sterile, uh, it, it colonizes really rapidly and we see the development of quite unique um, microbiota profiles in in those babies. And and you highlighted something really uh, important about the cesarean section is that they often give the uh, the mother 
uh, like a prophylactic antibiotic, meaning something that would prevent infection before, even before there's the delivery happens. And, and how does that, what effect does that have on this transfer of microbes? Yeah, so it does play an important role because when you have that prophylactic antibiotic, you are disrupting the natural gut uh, microbiome. So if we're looking at using the term microbiome itself, it is being disrupted by the use of antibiotics. We know that that itself, and I write about this in the book, that exposure to those antibiotics early in life by causing that alteration in the microbiota balance it can lead to an imbalance of the gut microbes, what we call a dysbiosis, and that actually has health implications. Um, for example, it increases the likelihood of a child developing an, an allergy in life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's, that's what's, I think, most interesting uh, about your book is that there, you know, you're, you're a gastroenterologist, but you spend a, a lot of the book talking about allergies which is immunology, right? Yeah. So what, what is the connection there between um, immunology and, and the gut? And why would, why, would disrupting, um, why would that disruption of the microbiota mess up the immune system and cause allergies? I mean, that's, that, yeah. that is not intuitive, I would say. <laughs> and it's such a really, really good question because I think what it comes down to is the recognition that the gut itself is uh, a very important immune organ. For example, uh, two thirds of all the immune cells in the body are found in the gut. So we don't realize this. I mean, uh -huh. we're realizing a lot about the gut itself. We know it's important for the process I mentioned before, digestion, absorption, full of microbes, but actually it does play an important role in the immune system. So as an example of this, uh, we know that yeah. uh, from experiments, that some animals can be born germ-free. So they're born in a germ-free environment, they're actually born in these incubators, which have an independent sterile air circuit, and they're born by cesarean section. And what we realized about these um, mice in particular, and as I said, a lot of the work's been done in, in mice, but we realized that they are different from normal mice in that their immune systems is uh, quite compromised. Um, uh -huh. So they are much more susceptible uh, to it. Um, into infections. And as a good example of that is that with these germ-free mice, they can get sick from just 10 salmonella cells in the gut, whereas conventional mice can withstand about a million salmonella cells before becoming unwell. So, oh, wow. so the gut's very important for um, the immune system. And the reason why it's important when it comes to, to humans and infants here is that the same principle applies that if you've got disruption of your normal gut microbiota, so if you think about it, the antibiotics being exposed early in life is actually wiping out some of the uh, some of some of the microbes. Then what? You, then that that itself means that you could, you're going to get less of the normal or commensal bacteria in the gut, and because of those bacteria are so important for your immune system, it actually leads to to problems and it leads to those um, that susceptibility to certain kinds of immune uh, problems like allergies. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, one thing I always find, what should I say, interesting or challenging about when you're talking about immunology is there's this thing where, you know, if, if something is, if, if the immune system's not working well enough, um, you get sick and, and, you know, like extreme case would be something like HIV where your immune system is just not working at all. Um, and you're, you're getting sick from these common things that would not make people with a healthy immune system sick. But then on the, on the other side of it, you have autoimmune diseases where the immune system is like overactive and, and doing, uh, things that are not, you know, attacking the body itself, uh, things that aren't foreign objects. So how does, how does this, as you said, commensal bacteria, that's, that's the sort of symbiotic bacteria living in our gut, how does, how does it affect the immune system in terms of making it responsive enough but not too responsive? That's, that's something I, I – does my question make sense? Yeah, it, it does. <laughs> First actually, of all. you know, um, 
I mean, to answer that question, I guess I've got to do a bit of a deeper dive um, into immunology and talk about some concepts which I think your audience may have heard about already, but I think it's important to go through them. So I think the important there's an yeah, I think that I think that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So look, I suppose um, if we want to go back to the very beginning, um, well, it, it all links back to the hygiene hypothesis. So <laughs> this is the idea, um, Eric, and it's a very popular one as well that. Uh, that, that if you are exposed, um, and this is the conventional thinking behind this, is if exposed to dirty things out there, then it actually somehow um, primes your immune system or makes you more resistant against infections. But actually, it's a bit more complex and more nuanced than that. So really, it came back, um, this came back to a, a large study that was done in the United Kingdom, where they looked at uh, the incidence of hay fever in children in the United Kingdom after the war. And what they found was that in these children, that the more uh, older siblings a child would have, the less likely that he or she was to develop eczema by the age of one year and hay fever by the age of 23. So mm -hmm. that, and what is eczema? Sorry, what is eczema just for, uh, for well, the Eczema audience? is dermatitis, so allergic dermatitis, so uh -huh. contact dermatitis. Yeah, that's X. Okay, so, so that's that. like where an an, al an allergen is like irritating your skin, essentially. Yeah, ex exactly right. So okay. like, yeah, so. Okay, so, so go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify because I'm not sure everyone knew yeah, that, yeah. what that meant. So that, that's, yeah, that, look, that, thanks, thanks for clarifying that. Um, and so the, the professor who, who reported this, Professor Strawn, um, he recognized that was some protective effect that the older siblings were passing on to the younger children. Now, I think that um, most of us who have more than one child, um, we know that these children, when they play together, things can be a bit rough. So, you know, sometimes, you know, they can even bite and scratch. And, and there's something that's been passed on from one child to another that's considered to be protective against allergy. And so Professor Strawn, he felt that that special protective effect was actually microbes. Um, and that early childhood exposure so particular microbes could protect against the development of allergies by affecting the development of the immune system. And so that was what the hygiene hypothesis was about. It wasn't about um, not washing your hands or just getting dirty. That, that wasn't what that was about. It was about exposure to particular microbes early in life. And so I see. the okay. scientific community got really excited by this. And they came up with this, what we call TH1, TH2 imbalance. So what TH1 mm -hmm. cytokines refer to, they are really what we call pro-inflammatory cytokines. So they're specifically designed to actually kill off bacteria that get inside our cells uh. and viruses. Uh, but when you've got a really excessive pro-inflammatory response, which can cause a lot of tissue damage, there's got to be a way to counteract that. And so mm -hmm. those are the TH2 cytokines. And the TH2 cytokines, mm -hmm. they counteract the TH1 cytokines and they're really good at fighting off parasites such as worms that are located outside of our cells. And so some of these TH2 cytokines are anti-inflammatory. The problem, however, is that if you've got a very vigorous TH2 cytokine response that can actually promote allergy. So that's the, that's the I suppose, the trade-off there. And what we realize is that there are some factors that promote a TH1 uh, response. So presence of older siblings, um, early exposure, mm -hmm. for example, to daycare, household pets, exposure to a rural environment, those are very much TH1 promoting. On the other hand, TH2 cytokine response, that's favored by use of antibiotics, as we talked about, and generally a more industrialized lifestyle. So now that we know that there's this, prince, this kind of, a, it's a simplistic concept because there's a bit more in, 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 to immunology than just TH1, TH2, but what we realize is that um, we certainly with TH1, you do need to have, and this comes back to the whole idea of microbes, that exposure to these microbes um, early in life. And we realize now um, that these microbes have been around, um, the, the microbes that, that really promote the TH1 response, um, they are microbes that have been around in our environment for a long time. And so, you know, what we call mm -hmm. old friends. In fact, there's a whole hypothesis yeah. around this, Eric, <laughs> what we call the old friends hypothesis in that 
You know, we need these old friends, these microbes, these commensals. <laughs> we need them yeah. to face yeah. the TH1 response. Yeah. And when we don't have yeah. those, or when those old friends aren't around because of things like antibiotics or more industrialized lifestyle, you know, herbicides, pesticides, etc., then we see, you know, um, more of a TH2 response and hence the rise of yeah. allergy. I see. Okay. So, so those... So those old, it, those old friend microbes are um, maybe over time are through evolution, our bodies sort of started to recognize those as not being a threat. Is that a way to think of it? Yeah. And that these newer exposures to, you know, as you said, you know, chemicals and, and industrial uh, kind of things in our environment is a new kind of thing and so that that's going to set off an alarm for that th2 response is that is that a it, way it to think of it, it absolutely does so for example okay. we know that many of the pesticides herbicides organic solvents they actually favor yeah. the th2 response and so uh, these are things that have been around re fairly recently you know um because of industrialization so we're seeing more of that out there we're seeing more of the <laughs> yeah. you know the these these artificial chemicals out there and so it's 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 really pushing us more towards that th2 response and when you get that early in life then you you certainly get promotion of a more um of a more of an allergic response in, in young children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, it's it's almost uh it's not. It, it's like having an overactive immune system in a way, right? I mean, it's 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 overreacting to these things that aren't aren't necessarily threats, right? Yes. That well, that, that's that's correct. So what we know about that is yeah. that you know, your allergy certainly has been linked to an elevated Th2 response or elevated Th2 reactivity. And in fact, after birth, we know that Th2 reactivity in most infants it actually goes. Um, it goes down. So most infants that tend to be what we call non-atopic or don't have a genetic susceptibility to allergy, they don't have the, the TH2 reactivity goes down. We know that the, that yeah. TH2 reactivity can persist for a few years uh, in a large proportion of infants, but again, it eventually dampens down. So that's why some children might have um, some allergies early in, in life. For example, they might have this childhood eczema or um, allergic dermatitis mm -hmm. in life, but it disappears and that TH2 response yeah. goes down. But there is a small yeah. proportion um, of children that have a persistently elevated TH2 response. And we would know with those children that they tend to have allergies that develop and persist um, later in life into adulthood. Mm hmm. So the so the timing also is very important for the for this uh, these exposures to these different things, right? Um, uh, I think you said in the book it was you know maybe the first six months of life to to you need exposure to these old friends and to avoid these. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we want to call them new friends. New, um, <laughs> they're not friends at all. Um, I, you need we need a clever name for that too. I think um, for you know new new kinds of exposure. So what is that right? Is that the time frame yeah. we're talking about in particular for infants? Absolutely yeah. right. So look, I think mm -hmm. that you know early exposure to these old friends is very important because it helps to prime the immune system. So in other words. When you have these bacteria, which have been around in the environment for a long time, the, and when the, uh, when the infant recognizes these, these um, uh, old friends, the, the, the gut itself um, is recognizing it too. And, and it's, it's necessary for the, for the gut, for the commensal, for the, for the natural resident bacteria to recognize these, these bacteria. And it then helps to trigger and promotes that positive TH1 response. It creates a balance essentially. Um, so mm -hmm, th that's mm -hmm. all really important. And the other important thing as well, and it's important that, that I, I raise this in the book, it's the concept of tolerance. So we know mm -hmm. that, particularly when it comes to allergies, that it's a balance really between recognizing, your immune system recognizes an invader. So it recognizes what we call a pathogen or an allergy, it recognizes an invader and it primes and has immune response. And that's normal, it's natural. Like Eric, you and I, our immune systems are designed 
to respond to pathogens, invaders, and, and they quickly mount a response and gets rid of it. But we mm-hmm. also need to recognize that there are some um, uh, what we call old friends and in fact other, um, uh, other resident bacteria we need, we need our body needs to recognize that the resident bacteria in the gut itself is actually commensal, that it's actually part of us. And it, it needs to knock mm-hmm. out a, a hostile immune response. And that's why the idea of tolerance comes about. So tolerance comes about early in life. You recognize, it recognizes these, you know, this is normal. Uh, this is part of us early in life. And so that bacteria, those bacteria that I mentioned before, the old friends, it's recognizing them yeah. as actually part of us early in life and not mounting immune response. And that's actually a really important point. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that make. I, I mean, it. I think that makes sense, but it's a little bit different than, as you said, than the um, idea that, well, uh, let's, let's talk about this for a second. So there's this, I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure the official name, but, you, but you, you highlight this a couple times, is that uh, both pregnant women and young kids it'd be really beneficial for them to hang out at a farm for a, for a bit, or at least have a visit there. Um, now that sounds like a crazy idea to me in a way, because, you know, a farm is, you know, the perception is it's very dirty. There's a lot of animal waste. There's, um, you know, probably all kinds of pollen everywhere and, you know, who knows what else. So could you, <laughs> so th- in a way that seems like kind of a, a, a uh, an extreme way to like expose kids to to a ton of microbes, but th- there there's some evidence that like this is actually really beneficial, right? Yeah. So Eric, um, we know that there's been some um, really good evidence um, based upon very large studies looking at this. For example, there was the Parsifal study. So the Parsifal study that was published um, about a decade ago, actually now, um, and it followed about a thousand children that were born to. Our farm and what they, they term non-farm mothers. So really, um, uh, children that were not uh, in that were not born in, in a very rural environment, in a more urban environment. So this was actually a large study. It was done across a few countries. So in about five European countries, and what they want to look at was the, I guess, the linkage between childhood um, allergy, particularly childhood asthma, and also um, what was going on. Uh, with their environmental circumstances. And they looked, of course, at the farm environment because they realized that there was a difference between the, the groups, between the children that were born um, to, to farm, um, to essentially farm mothers and non-farm mothers. They realized that there was a reduction in childhood allergies. And they realized, what was that protective effect? And so um, they carried out over 8,000 questionnaires. And what they found was that um, when they looked at the, the specific factors the, the, interesting enough that the children that had, I guess, the best immune systems, the ones that had the less, least allergies, the, the mothers were actually involved in stable work during pregnancy. So they're exposed to stables. So, <laughs> <laughs> which was like, you think about it. It like, sounds insane. I'm sorry. You know, but... I mean, doing stable work when you're pregnant, it can't, it goes against something that is almost, um, you know, it's, it's like it's like these days. Would we even consider the idea of having a, a pregnant uh, woman um, on a farm working in stables? You no, know? I mean that's just, it. Sounds it sounds absolutely crazy, as you said. But what they what they've realized is that you know it, it was a protective effect, and there were pro- there was probably something in the farm environment that was protective. And in fact, you know what was actually protective was. Was it was thought that it's these these endotoxins? And it sounds like a, a again a pretty crazy concept, okay? But the endotoxins is actually something in the environment that's actually very good for the uh, for the immune system, um, and particularly promoting a Th two um, what switch from mm-hmm. away from Th two to more towards more of a Th one response. So you get a lot of endotoxins. And in, um, sorry. So what is an endotoxin exactly? So. What, what they basically are is that they're basically um, chemicals, essentially, that are produced by microbes. So it's probably the best thing to, to say that they're, they, they could be the, um, the wall components of microbes, for example. They, there's something called lipopolysaccharide, which is part of the bacterial wall. Um, generally, they're mm. the components of microbes. And 
they are particularly high um, in farm stables, very, very high, uh, and you know, particularly in um, horse, um, like, you know, and other poultry. Um, so it's thought then, speculated now, that perhaps exposure to these endotoxins is actually what is protective here. Um, and yeah. that, that is, that's probably underpins why the, the possible study showed such an important and I suppose surprising results that protective effect of, of from others being exposed to stables. And it really, I guess, if you think about it, Eric, it, it actually turns um, our thinking around here. And maybe, maybe yeah. just maybe, instead of having a baby moon in a normal kind of a, you know, a, a, a typical, you know, beach kind of environment, perhaps a baby moon could be spent on the farm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, <laughs> that seems to make a lot of sense. <laughs> Um, I, I, so one thing I, one thought I had about this is that, okay, um, you know, you're, say you're going to a farm or in another in, environment. I mean, you could, you could apply this to other kinds of exposures, but, you know, in reality, there actually are some kind of nasty bacteria that are around too, that, um, you know, you could get sick from or, you know, some kind of avian virus or something like that when you're in that kind of environment. Is there, I mean, is there any risk associated with doing that sort of thing as well that, that you could, you know, get sick from that? Um, it, it almost seems as if, you know, you want a bit of an exposure, but not, but once you expose yourself, you're exposing yourself to other things, I guess is what I'm mm. getting at. Yeah. So again, I think that is a, a good a good question because you know intuitively no. we would think that going to a farm or getting involved in it, so, <laughs> it just it just feels like wrong, right? I mean, it goes. It's it, but yeah. then we realize when you look at the data and you look at the hygiene hypothesis, um, I think that well, I think it's important to recognize that you know this kind of exposure has been around for a long time. In fact, it's been around for thousands, mm. thousands of years, Eric. I mean, this is what, what happened for thousands of years. It's, a, it's actually changed with us. It's a, it's a kind of a radical paradigm shift, but as a result of a more industrialized society, we no longer do this. We no longer have these exposures to a predominantly you know rural or agrarian type of environment, which was around for yeah. thousands and thousands of years. So that that, that was the conventional thinking for thousands of years and it was almost expected. You know, in recent times, the last, you know, certainly in the last hundred years, it's been a big switch. But you know something? What's really interesting, Eric, is that what we've realized in the last hundred years is there's been a spike in, in, in allergies and all the other conditions that we've talked about as well, including autoimmune diseases. So right. Th th right. There, there is something yeah. to all this. Um, sure, of course, there's potentially pathogens that may be potentially, um, you know, um, uh, that, that, that could potentially be dangerous. Certainly, that, that, that that's a possibility. Yeah. But in, in reality, I think the, the risk is actually quite low. And I think that um, what needs what we need to think about here is that if there is, um, and I guess this is where the radical mind shift here is here as well, if there is a real imperative to look at addressing, for example, some of the root causes of childhood allergies, and we can do something about that and intervene early, yeah. then it just might be worth thinking about so something like this. It's a radical change in our mind yeah. shift, but perhaps we should be yeah. open-minded. Yeah. Well, it really does seem to argue for, you know, adopting or at least, you know, vi um, adopting temporarily a sort of agrarian lifestyle where you have, you know, a lot of animals around, you have a lot of other kids around your kids and they're just getting exposed to a lot of different things, right? Um, I guess maybe I'm thinking like, also when we're talking about farms, maybe it makes a difference too, whether you're talking about like a family farm or you're talking, obviously, you know, industrial agriculture has other problems with, you know, mm -hmm. diseases and things like that because it's a bit of a monoculture. Yeah. So maybe, so when we're talking about farms, maybe we're talking, is that true? Am I right there? Or is, you're, you're I mean, quite obviously, correct. You're quite correct. So yeah. if we were looking at the ideal um, baby moon, well, we'll call, we'll call it, maybe we'll call it a, a baby farm moon um, as such. But if we were looking at, at the ideal um, 
stay during pregnancy, it would it would be in, in a farm, as you mentioned, not a conventional industrialized farm where you see lots of herbicides and pesticides, mm-hmm. uh, because mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. Kind of, it, comes, it comes sort of counter to what we're, we're talking about here. Um, but a traditional farm, um, you know, a very small farm environment, and I, I feel even exposure and, you know, the data supports this, as you talked about, even if there's exposure to, to a number of pets, you know, I think that itself would be very, very beneficial because having a number of pets creates almost a mini farm environment. Um, so that there, there, is a, there is benefits there from having um, just even a few domesticated animals um, in, in, in sort of close contact, um, not just for yeah. the pregnant uh, mother, but also for the young infant. And I think that's important to recognize the young infant too would, would, has would yeah. benefit from being um, in that farming environment. Right. I, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that definitely runs counter to the idea that um, if you are prone to allergies and, and, and as you mentioned, I think in the book, there is definitely a genetic component to this, right? In terms of risk of allergies, but you shouldn't, because you have that risk, like, let's say you had, let's take a situation, like you had parents that are, um, both have allergies to some kind of animal or cats or whatever, Mm -hmm. then they, they would go, okay, well, my kid, my, you know, we're having a kid, this kid's going to be, you know, probably going to have a higher risk of having that allergy. So their, their, their immediate thought would be, well, we need to isolate that kid from that animal, that allergen that we have exposure to, but actually it's, it runs counter to that. They should expose that kid early in life. Right. Is that exactly, exactly. That's exactly right, Eric. And that I think is one of the key points that I, that I talk about in this book and really, um, it's about getting exposure early. So the things that we think Mm -hmm. as typical allergens get exposed to those early because it, because importantly, it can build up tolerance. So you're quite right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, getting exposure to some of those, um, animals, um, early on, but I I think, you know, because the animals themselves, uh, whether it's through their, um, endotoxins, um, or, 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 or or the microbes that, that, that are present, but certainly there is a protective effect for pregnant mothers and for, and for young children, but it's not just that as well. Um, um, Eric, it goes beyond that. Um, exposure to allergenic foods, early in life as well, can also um, promote tolerance. So the concept is get exposure to the things that we think intuitively we want to avoid. (laughs) Get exposed (laughs) early in life. Actively get get exposed. And and you, so to kind of bring it back to to food and uh, which, you know, ties directly into gastroenterology, which, which is your, what your background is in what there, there, you highlighted, uh, there's like nine different foods that are, or something that are responsible for 90% of allergies, right? Absolutely. So what are those foods and, and, um, and, and, you know, should you be feeding your infant these things or <laughs> a toddler at least? Maybe not infants, but toddlers. Absolutely. So you're, you're quite right. Okay. There are indeed nine. Um, different uh, allergens, food allergens in particular, that underpin about 90% of all of the food allergies. And that would be the, that would be yeah. the case for Australia and for North America. So, you know, the big ones would be, you know, peanut, obviously egg, milk, uh, sesame. We know that um, shellfish itself and wheat are also big ones too. Um, but I guess also um, egg allergy too, dairy um, are big yeah. ones. So there's about nine nine of them that are really important. And in my book, I actually talk about a nine week plan <laughs> to introduce mm. infants, um, really starting from about six months of age to these these allergens. And again, it's about the recognition that if you expose these infants early in a very um, controlled manner, so you want to do it in a controlled mm-hmm. manner where you can observe for response early in life, starting from about six months, between six months and 12 months is the critical time there. That's the time yeah. when you can prime the the the, um, the young infant um, to develop an immune response that promotes tolerance for these for these foods. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so is there 
looking at that list, my immediate thought was, well, a lot of these foods are high in protein, or is that is that a component to why they're tend to be allergens? Yeah, uh, that, that, is, that is true. So for example, um, we know, for example, that um, with many of the proteins themselves, um, they are not broken down necessarily all that well um, by, by the gut. Mm. And a good example of that example is gluten. You know, so gl- gluten, which is commonly right. found, found, found in wheat, is, is one that we know isn't commonly broken down um, very well. Now, when when you've got proteins that aren't broken down very well, what that can what what that means is that the proteins themselves can get across into the bloodstream, what we call the systemic circulation and mounted immune response. And it does that because of factors like the leaky gut. So, the the medical term for that, mm-hmm. Eric, we call that intestinal permeability. But that's where things can get can get across the gut. There's a the gut normally has a barrier. And when you get across that gut barrier into the bloodstream, you get that you get the amount of immune response, and so that yeah. actually is the reason for why um, we have uh, a, a response, um, a systemic response to 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 these allergens. And you know, it, it, it was a, with, with it, once we get once we get that immune cascade, we get that that response happening. Um, then you have. Um, and this is what I talk more about anaphylaxis as well and, and what, what can really happen when, yeah. when things go, go quite dire because you actually have, and it's, it's kind of complicated, but you've actually got special immunoglobulins like IgE at work here. You've got certain cells which release a lot of chemicals um, and these cells are actually primed with chemicals. They release it in response to these allergens and the response is really quick and can lead to all sorts of uh, problems including reduction in blood pressure um difficulty in breathing um and and all the and all the all the really concerning symptoms that you might expect in someone who has a has a has a, has a major response or a major systemic yeah. response to an allergen so um I- is there so one question about that uh anaphylaxis thing i mean is there uh it seems so extreme and the fact that you can actually die from it, right? Because your airways can close off and, um, is, I mean, is that, how is that protective? I guess is the question. You, it's so extreme and your body's going through this terrible experience. I mean, is that, is there, a, is there a good reason for oh, anaphylaxis guess. to yeah. exist or is it just kind of your immune system freaking out and, and, you know, overreacting? Well, look, I think that the, the important point here is that um, there is a very yeah. rapid release of chemicals in the body that's resulting, as you say, in this very profound life-threatening response. So things that you're getting essentially that weak and rapid re- uh, pulse, you know, the, the low blood pressure, constriction of the airways, all that is occurring because your body is responding to uh, an allergen well, and, and responding to it in a very adverse way. Now, um, the, 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 there is a natural, I suppose, if you think from an evolutionary perspective, you know, we have these allergens that we uh, mount a response to. So it's when you've got pathogens, um, our body has a, has a natural immune reaction to a, to a pathogen, and we, we, we actually have an innate immune response. So it, it's like the body is mm-hmm. primed to respond against these, um, these pathogens. And certainly when it comes to um, an allergic response, our body also is primed to respond against certain allergens because it recognizes that those allergens shouldn't really be there. Now, yeah. um, for the most part, the, the response is actually fairly well uh, controlled. So you don't typically get um, an allergic response that is life-threatening, fortunately, most of the time. Otherwise, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. You can imagine if that right, happened, right, you know, right. we'd all be in a lot of trouble. But but <laughs> what, what is occurring essentially is that you, 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 that there is this um, recognition by the body uh, of of the allergen, and a profound response is developing to the allergen based upon um, immunological memory. So the body has a memory of this of this allergen being there, and the response it mounts is actually really profound. 
Uh -huh, now, uh -huh. we think that this, that the research is now favoring that, yes, okay, for many of us, particularly when we're infants, we could have been exposed to many of these um, food allergens, if we're talking about food allergies. But yeah, if you're yeah. exposed to these allergies early in life, it tends to be more of what we call uh, that the, the, the immune system tends to recognize it and develops tolerance. Mm -hmm. However, if you are exposed to that allergen later on, and maybe because of some um, erroneous assumption that your that the the infant should mature should 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 have a more developed immune system, what we know is that when that happens, the the response itself tends to be um, a lot more profound. And then when you've got another uh. challenge, it tends to. And yeah, this is a this is what we what we're noticing here based upon large studies, that the, this the, each time it happens, you get a more profound response, and that's why anaphylaxis can occur, for example, to peanuts with only very very tiny hmm. amounts. Um, so yeah. Um, so so it's not. A, I mean, so yes, you know, um, there there is memory. We, we we recognize early life or exposed to certain allergens, but the earlier you're exposed. The more you develop, the more yeah. likely you develop tolerance. Later on, not I, so good. <laughs> it, 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 um, I mean, if you, th I, I was, my background's in genetics, and I, I'm really interested in human evolution and things like that. And I always think about it in those, in that context. But it does kind of make sense when you think about it that if, if we were, you know, hunter gatherers. Uh, we would have been exposed to so many different things when we were y very young, and those things wouldn't change over time, right? I mean, those they'd be so, there's be this kind of consistency of the things in our environment, mm -hmm. and now we live in this world where it's like we may not be exposed to things when we're very young, and then all of a sudden we're getting introduced all these different foods and things from like all over the world, <laughs> basically because we're in this global economy. Yes. Um, from all these different continents and, and, you know, and it's like, those are not things that maybe we would have evolved with. So it, it, that does, it does seem to kind of make sense in a way, right? It, it absolutely does. And a good example of this, yeah. Eric, is um, from what we know from Singapore. So prior to 1990, you know, peanut allergy wasn't even a, a major food allergy in Singapore. But then with the adoption of a more Western diet, as, and as you say, a more international cuisine um, very mm -hmm. quickly yeah, um, yeah. by 2016 um, peanut allergy became the number one food allergy in Singapore so you know you're quite right in, in that uh, these I, uh, I suppose globalization international exposures um, to different you know foods and, and, and chemicals and substances that's actually changing the immunological response of our of our infants our children yeah yeah and peanut allergies have uh, been on the rise, I think, in the United States as well. Um, so I guess, as, I, so as parents, I guess the um, the idea is that you need to, um, you know, it, it be deliberate about exposing your kids to these things and not just kind of wait for them to encounter them later in life. Um, but again, it's like, comes back to, okay, well, if you already have an allergy to that thing, you know, you're probably going to be reticent to expose your kids to those things. So it's like, you know, you, there has to you, it has to be um, it has to be very intentional. I think that you're going to do this. That's absolutely right, and that's one of the key yeah. messages that I want to convey in this in, in my book. In that, mm -hmm. I think that we should be, um, and parents especially, need to be open to, open to that. It's really important to to recognize it. You know, certainly during pregnancy. Um, there shouldn't be any restrictions on um, allergenic foods, unless, of course, you've got a, a known allergy. If you've got a known allergy to that particular food, yeah. of course, it's different. But uh, you shouldn't be worried about, for example, um, your, your your children developing an allergy to a food and thereby avoiding that during pregnancy. That's not that's not that's completely not 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 what you should be doing. In fact, exposure yeah. to these allergenic foods like peanuts early in pregnancy again, is considered to be um, very beneficial, promotes tolerance, um, exposure of your infants to different foods um, and to different exposures, positive exposures, early life, like pets, for example, environment, environment those are beneficial. Yeah. 
So again, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's. I think we've got to change the mindset from, you know, being, you know, worried and anxious about it to actively promoting that, actively, yeah, looking at at at, at, at you know encouraging exposure. Now, if you. If you are an adult or you have kids that already have allergies uh, that they've developed uh, because they haven't, you know, you haven't done this or you weren't as a child exposed to a lot of different things that you probably should have been. Is there anything that you can do or are you just kind of is your immune system kind of locked into having this overreaction to the, to that allergen? Yeah. So, again, you know, I'm of the belief that that you know dna is not destiny um, I'm, I'm of that school <laughs> of thinking um and you might think why do i think that and i think i i although it's true that um your genetic predisposition to allergy a to p is very important there are things that you can do to modulate that even later on in life so we know from one study that was done in denmark and published in 2015 that if adults were exposed to a farm environment it can actually make a difference. And it actually does reduce their likelihood of um, adult um, allergies. So it's not too late to have the uh, positive exposures. The Certainly, we know that the farm environment um, or exposure to a mini farm environment with pets is considered to be very, very helpful, um, very beneficial from all the data that we that we know about it, and it's been replicated across many studies across the world. I think the difficulty um, there is is actually encouraging people who are busy, um, people to take time in their busy lives to actually make a trip out and go and go to the farm. And certainly for myself yeah. and my family, um, you know, <laughs> it wasn't something that was on our radar um, until you know my first. You know, my, my firstborn, my, my, my daughter, Olivia, who inspired me with, to write the book in the first place until she developed right. egg allergy. It was after that that we, once I started researching it, that I realized, you know what? I've got to get out of the city. <laughs> I've got to act. Because <laughs> I grew up in the city myself and so did my wife. And it was a big yeah, mind shift, yeah, yeah. mindset to actually do that. Um, but I think once you once you put your mind to it, uh, you realize, yep, it's worth doing. And you know, the data says that even at any age, it's beneficial. So not too late to right. go out there and make that yeah. trip out to the farm. <laughs> well, I can tell you from experience, there's a, there's a great way to do that. And you can also support your support local agriculture is to join a farm share, um, you know, where you get a box of fruit and vegetables from local farmers. And then they often do farm uh, invites and you can go visit. So that's that's just one thought on that and you're getting you're getting fed as well so that's always you know makes it makes it a, a double win awesome. <laughs> so so in your book you talked about some uh, more novel ways to mitigate you know living in an industrial society where infants are not exposed to um, to microbes that they need to or allergens what are what are some of those cool new uh out of the box things that are people are trying yeah so these are what we call potential future treatment strategies now um they're not actively recommended at the moment because we need more evidence but certainly these are things that are, are on the horizon one of them is vaginal seeding so that's the mm -hmm. idea that um we can swab a newborn that's delivered by c-section with their mother's vaginal fluids shortly after birth and the reason why we might do that is because the data supports that in infants that are born from from c-section they are at a greater risk of allergies notably asthma and so yeah. if we could modify uh, their microbiota by um, actively giving them some of the microbes from the vagina um, that may be beneficial and so there is one study that's been done um, that was actually done in 2016 um, and this was only a very small study so um, they, it, was, it was a study done from the University of California and they found that of it was actually four of the c-section infants that were treated with vaginal uh, sw swabbing or seeding I should call immediately after birth and what they found was that 
a month after the uh, swabbing, they found that their gut microbiota and also the skin microbiota was actually very similar to that of vaginally delivered babies. So um, it had changed compared to what you might expect from C-section babies. So that was actually a very interesting. That study wasn't designed to show health outcomes, but it was just meant mm-hmm. to show that if you can transfer microbes from vaginal fluids, then it can actually lead to changes in that infant's gut microbes. So that was what was interesting. Got a lot of attention. Um, would we support that actively? I think if we're going, to, if uh, what I would say is that that should only be done in the context of a clinical trial. And the reason for that is that mm-hmm. you want to make sure that if you were give, giving those microbes, those microbes are actually safe. For example, we don't want any group B yeah. prep. That's actually very harmful for the for the infant, and so yeah. there needs to be a way to screen for that. So really, I would only recommend it in the context of a clinical trial. So that's one novel it, thing. So so I just want to jump. So yeah. um, I know the one thing they're, that they're doing with C-section babies is they're they're making a big point also to to have the baby have some initial contact with the mother, skin to skin contact. Is that would that also be of benefit to um, to youngsters, definitely, to newborns? Definitely. So yeah. in, in contact, I think that's really important to have that skin to skin contact early on. That does make a big difference with the mother um, and also with, with a partner as well. So I think that close mm-hmm. bonding is really important because it does promote um, a lot of tr- uh, transfer of some healthy microbes. Now, a lot of those microbes yeah. might be actually skin microbes, but they're still considered to be a very, a very healthy um, transfer of, of good of good microbes, and that's that's, that's really quite yeah. important. Um, so yes, and we have a skin we have a skin microbiome as well. So it's yeah. the, there's lots you know that that the infant would be getting as well as the, and then also breastfeeding too. We didn't talk about that, but and maybe not exactly right for this audience, but that's another way that that babies can get. Uh, uh, microbes a hundred percent on that yeah. um and yeah. the best way i would describe breast milk is that it's really personalized nutrition for the baby you know it's adaptive it's uh, dynamic it, it responds to the baby's needs and there's a lot of healthy microbes in it too and so yes we haven't covered a breast milk but there's a lot to be said for <laughs> um breast milk and, and passing healthy microbes to the baby yes yeah um, and then uh, you, I think you mentioned uh, another kind of interesting trial that someone was doing to, you know, in this space um, with like bee venom or something like that. Yeah, well, there's something called immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is actually really interesting. So that's something that actually has been looked at currently uh, as a way to, the best way to describe it is it's allergy vaccination, right? So, you know, it's a type of, I guess you'd say immunotherapy is a type of allergy whereby the body's exposed to small amounts of of an allergen um, and you gradually increase that dose. So eventually the body builds up immunity to the allergen. Um, And that means Mm -hmm. that in the future, you should have a reduced response to to that allergen. Now, it's been done um, and it's been quite successful when it comes to insect sting allergies. So people have looked at it. um, Uh It's been quite effective, for example, for bee stings. When it comes to peanut allergies, um, because peanut allergies, you know, can be so lethal to to um, to uh, to, in, to young children, um, it has been studied. Now, initially, they used um, injection-based immunotherapy, and they found that, that was actually very dangerous um, to, um, to to infants. And so, they've gone to um, oral immunotherapy, where you sw- swallow a small amount of uh, peanut extract and see if that actually makes a difference. It's still controversial because even though mm. um, it's been u- used, and certainly I know that in, in North America um, it is available, um, it's still controversial because there have been some large studies, what we call systematic reviews, that have found that that oral immunotherapy uh, for peanuts does actually increase the risk of anaphylaxis. So it needs to be used judiciously and with care. And so... I would recommend um, if a parent is thinking about look the use of oral immunotherapy um, for peanuts, yeah. a careful discussion with an immunologist before embarking upon that. 
Yeah, it's not something you should just experiment with at home, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's it, what basically what you're saying. It's still novel, um, and we're collecting yeah. more more evidence about it all the time. So, you know, it's yeah. watch this space. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, cool. So um, that's probably a good place to wrap up. Um, so I always ask guests, um, and I think I mentioned this at the top of the interview, but is where can people find you and interact with you online? Are you on all the social media platforms or uh, have you successfully avoided those? Or <laughs> are, um, I know you have a website, so maybe you could just could just tell people where to find you. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, if you want to find more information about the gut and more information about the, the interesting topics that we talked about today, you can find me on my website, which is uh, www.gutdoctor.com. So G-U-T-D-R.com. Um, and you can find all my yeah. social media links on the website and also where you can find uh, the book. Cool. Um, and the book's coming out in June, I believe. Yes. At least in the U.S. That's right. Cool. Coming out in, in, in awesome. June. Great. Um, well, this has been such an interesting and enlightening conversation. And um, thanks so much for speaking with me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope I hope the audience... Um, I know they will take away a lot of great information. So thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show.